Welcome to the Zoom room. We'll get right started right here on a statistics, uh, Cambridge statistics past paper. This is from October, November, 2021, uh, paper 51. And we're gonna look at the work solution. So our first question, two fair coins are thrown at the same time. The random variable X is the number of throws of the two coins required to obtain two tails at the same time. So if you wanna get two tails, that's uh, one half times one half, that's one fourth, that's your probability of success right here. And then of course, three fourths is the probability of failure for any given throw. So for A, find the probability that two tails are obtained for the first time on the seventh throw. Now you need to be able to recognize this as a geometric distribution. First, we are dealing with discrete data. You're either gonna get two tails or you're not. There's no, there's no spectrum here. There's no uh, halfway or three quarter way. You either got it or you don't. This is discrete data, which means it's either binomial or geometric distribution. And the fact that there's not a specific number of trials uh, which would be bi uh, binomial, uh, you just keep doing it until you get the first success. That's geometric distribution. So we happen to get the first success on the seventh throw. So that means the first six throws were failures and the last one, the seventh one was success. So we have three fourths, which is our probability of failure to the sixth power because there's six of them and one success, so multiplied by one fourth, and that gives us 0.0445 to three significant figures. Find the probability that it takes more than nine throws to obtain two tails for the first time. So if you have more than nine, then that means you have to at least fail nine times if you takes more than nine throws. It means you have to fail nine times. So three fourths uh, raised to the ninth power is equal to 0 0.0751. If you don't really quite understand why that works, what you can do is you can calculate the 10th time, just like we did up here with the seventh. You can calculate the 10th time and then use your sum to infinity formula for a geometric progression and you'll be surprised that that comes out to 0 0.0751. Number two, <clears throat> a summary of 40 values of X gives the following information. Now notice uh, the format here is with coded data, coded data, which means some value has been uh, subtracted from each of the data points. And then it's been added up to give these particular values. So K is a constant, <clears throat> part A, given that the mean of the 40 values is 34, find the value of K. So we're given the value of the mean, that's 34, and we're gonna use our alternate formula for the mean, which is the sum of X minus K divided by N, and then we add back the K to go from the coded set back to the original set. So 520 divided by 40, which is the number of values, uh, plus K, that is when you add back the constant, uh, that will get you to 34, which is the original mean. So then you just solve for K. So K is 34 minus 13, which equals 21 is the value that had been deducted from all the value points. Uh, it is important to notice that this uh, 520 over 40, which turned into a 13, that is your small mean or the mean of the coded data set. <clears throat> We're gonna use that here. Find the variance of these 40 values of X. So variance uses the X squared, but we have the X minus K squared which is 9,640 divided by N, which again is 40 values. And since we're using the coded value formula, that means we have to subtract the mean, the coded mean squared, 
or the small mean, the small mean is 13 squared. So 241 minus 169 gives us a variance of 72. Number three, for her bedtime drink, Suki has either chocolate, tea, or milk with the probabilities of 0.45, 0.35, and 0.2 respectively. When she has chocolate, the probability that she has a biscuit is 0.3. When she has tea, the probability that she has a biscuit is 0.6. And when she has milk, she never has a biscuit. So if you draw a quick tree diagram, this will help you keep your numbers straight. So you have chocolate, tea, and milk with the uh, corresponding probabilities. And then for each one, you have either with a biscuit or without a biscuit. So that's 0.3 and 0.7 for the chocolate, 0.6 and 0.4 for the tea, and 0 and 1 for the milk, since she never has a biscuit with the milk. And we're doing a conditional probability. Find the probability that Suki has tea given that she does not have a biscuit. So the probability of tea given not biscuit equals the probability of tea and not biscuit divided by all the probabilities of not biscuit. So here we have tea and not biscuit, 0.35 times 0.4, that's in the numerator. And then all the not biscuits in the denominator. So that's 0.5 times point, sorry, 0.45 times 0.7, plus 0.35 times 0.4 and 0.20 times one. Gives 0.14 over 0.655, which turns into 0.214 to three significant figures. Number four, a fair spinner has edges numbered 0, 1, 2, 2. Another fair spinner has edges numbered negative 1, 0, 1. Each spinner is spun, the number on the edge on which the spinner comes to rest is noted. The random variable X is the sum of the numbers for the two spinners. So we need to draw a box first, a box diagram with 0, 1, 2, 2 for one spinner, negative 1, 0, 1 for the other spinner, and we add those values. So make sure you add uh, correctly. And we see now to do a probability distribution table, we see that the possible outcomes are negative one, zero, one, two, and three. So the possible values that X can take, negative one, zero, one, two, and three, then you're gonna find the probability that the random variable has that particular value. So notice we have three items here, four items here. So that's a total of 12 items there is one negative one, so it's one twelfth. There are two zeros, so it's two twelfths. There are uh, four ones, four twelfths, three twos and two threes. And I left them all in twelfths. You can reduce them if you want. For example, two twelfths, you can change into one sixth. I leave them all in the unreduced form because I like to add it up make sure it equals one, just as a double check to make sure I didn't miss anything. Then find the variance of X. Well, in order to do variance, you have to do E of X first, that is the expected mean, where you multiply each possible value times its probability and add them up. So each possible value times its probability, add them up, and you end up with 15 twelfths. Uh, make sure that you subtract on this 1 12th here, don't add, so you get 15 twelfths. Then for the variance, you square each possible value and then multiply it by its probability. Add those up and subtract the E of X squared. So here's the work for that, uh, multiplying it out and then adding them up, get 35 twelfths minus 15 twelfths squared, and all that comes out to 6548 uh, or 1.35. Raman and Sanjay are members of a quiz team which has nine members in total. Two photographs of the quiz team are to be taken. For the first photograph, the nine members will stand in a line. So how many different arrangements of the nine members are possible in which Raman will be at the center of the line? 
So we have one restriction here that is Raman uh, needs to be in the middle. So we have nine uh, uh, members and Raman will be right in the middle. So that's fixed. So we don't need to count him anymore. So now the other eight uh, can be arranged, however. So we have eight factorial gives us a total of 40,320 different uh, arrangements for these other eight members to be around Raman. Part B, how many different arrangements of the nine members are possible in which Raman and Sanjay are not next to each other? So if they're not next to each other, that means they need to have another member between them. And so we take the remaining seven members because we take Raman and Sanjay out. So that leaves us seven other members and then we put spaces both in front, between, and at the end of these seven members. These spaces are where Raman and Sanjay uh, can stand. So for the seven members, that seven factorial different ways of arranging those seven members. Then for Raman, he's got eight different spaces or eight different places where he can stand. And of course, he's going to take up one of the spaces so that leaves seven different places where Sanjay can stand. When you multiply all that out, you get 282,240 different arrangements. Now for the second photograph, the members will stand in two rows with five in the back row and four in the front row. And how many different ways can the nine members be divided into a group of five and a group of four? So you need to recognize from the first part of the problem, which was permutations, where your sequence mattered, now to where you're just in a group. You're either in the back row or the front row. The sequence doesn't matter. So this is now combinations. So for the first group, uh, you have nine members to choose from, and you're going to choose five to be in that back row group. After you've selected those five, there are now only four members left, and they all have to go into the front row. So that'd be four choose four, which of course is just one. Uh, there's just one group left. Uh, but for the nine choose five, there's 126 different groupings. So 126 times one, there's 126 different ways nine members can be divided into those two groups. Now what we're gonna do is for a random division into a group of five and group of four, find the probability that Raman and Sanjay are in the same group as each other. So we're gonna make cases here. One case is gonna be that they're both together in the back row, and the other case is that they're both together in the front row. So that's because they have to be together. So they're either in the back row or in the front row. That's our two cases. For the back row, which has five people in it, and our uh, Raman and Sanjay take up two of those slots, that means there's three slots left. And there are only seven members left to choose from because you already have Raman and Sanjay. So of the remaining seven members, you need to choose three. So that's 35 different ways that Raman and Sanjay can be together in the back row. If they're in the front row, uh, there's only four people in that uh, row. So you take out the two, that means there's seven people left from the, um, from the members and you only need to choose two. So there are 21 ways that they can be together in the front row. So adding 35 and 21 gives you 56 and the probability is 56 divided by the 126 that we got here for the total gives us four ninths or 0.444 to three significant figures. Moving on, the weights in kilogram of 15 rugby players in the Rebels Club and 15 soccer players in the Sharks Club are shown below. So here are all the Rebels and all the Sharks and their weights in kilogram. Represent the data by drawing a back-to-back -back stem and leaf diagram with rebels on the left-hand side of the diagram. So here's our stem and leaf. So we see all the way from 60 up to 90, actually up to 100. 
here. So for our stems, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. And then the rebels on the left. And so all those numbers go in there. And for the sharks, all the numbers then go to the right. So make sure you're careful. Fortunately, these were already written in order. So it should be pretty easy for you to make your stem and leaf diagram. Now to get the full four points credit, make sure you put a key. You need to have a key, which tells us how to interpret your stem and leaf diagram. So take out a cross section here, a representation. I chose 571 and it doesn't really, you could choose 083, 392. There's several ways of doing it. So I chose 571. What this means is you have 75 kilograms for the rebels and 71 kilograms for the sharks. So make sure you're clear on the meaning as well as the units and which group it belongs to. Find the median and the interquartile range for the rebels. So the rebels, which is this left-hand side, there's 15 uh, players. So 15 divides up evenly into seven and seven on both sides with an exact one in the middle. So that exact one is on the eighth player. So you have the eighth player uh, is in the middle with seven on each side that gives you a total of 15. So if we count here, going from the stem outwards, here's the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and the eighth one is 84. So 84 is the mean, there's an exact middle. Then there are seven people on both sides of that, and seven also has an exact middle, which is the fourth member. So first, second, third, fourth is 80. If you start from your mean, first, second, third, fourth, or sorry, the median, if you start from the median, first, second, third, fourth, is 93. So your first quartile is 80, your third quartile is 93. Your IQR or interquartile range is 93 minus 80, which gives you 13 for uh, your interquartile range. Then they want you to do a box and whisker plot for the sharks. So you go back and you need to basically do uh, the same thing for uh, oh, they already gave you, sorry, they already gave you the box and whisker for the sharks and you need to go back and you need to do the rebels. So you need your ma uh, maximum and minimum. So here's your minimum 75 and your maximum is 102. So here's your 75 and here is your 102, the minimum and maximum. You also need your quartile one, which was the 80 your median, which was the 84, and your quartile three, which was the 93. So put all those and create your box and whisker. Then make one comparison between the weights of the players and the rebels club and the weights of the players in the sharks club. So make sure when you're doing a comparison that you're not just comparing an actual data value. In other words, don't say, well, the maximum of the rebels is higher than the maximum of the sharks. Uh, you're not supposed to use actual data points. So you wanna use something that's calculated like uh, the average, the mean, or the range, something like that. Something that you actually have to calculate to compare. Now, uh, so the average weight of the rebels, and, and you don't actually even have to calculate it. You can see from the graph that these weights are all higher than these weights over here. And so obviously the average uh, weight is going to be, and this one is even skewed to the right here uh, a little bit. This one's also skewed a little bit, uh, but this one definitely has a higher average than this one here. That's what you want to comment on, something that's a calculated observation. So the average weight to the rebels is more than the average weight of the sharks. Okay, moving on to number seven, uh, the times in minutes that Carly spends uh, each day on social media are normally distributed with the mean of 125 and standard deviation of 24. Now, it already tells you that it's normal distribution. 
You can also tell because time is uh, not discrete, it's continuous data. Uh, you can take parts of minutes. And so part A, I here is on how many days of the year of a 365 day year, would you expect Carly to spend more than 142 minutes on social media? So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna do our notation. So our random variable is uh, distributed normally with our parameters of the mean, which is 125 and the variance, which is the standard deviation squared. So don't forget to put the square up there for your uh, parameter. And our probability is that a random variable is more than or greater than 142. So as soon as we see that greater than sign, we need to be aware of those three situations where you have to do a one minus P uh, when you have a greater than sign, when uh, your probability is less than uh, 50%. And also, uh, if you end up with a negative Z, uh, you have to change the Z to positive, find the probability and do one minus P. So there's three different times where you have to do a one minus P. Soon as you see it, make your little mark so that you don't forget when you get to the end, because uh, we can't do it now. We don't have a probability value here. So we need to do one minus P. So I put this here to remind me. Plug the 142 right into our standardization formula. So Z equals 142 minus the mean divided by standard deviation. So we only take the 24. When you calculate this, you get 0.7083. Now, a Z value only has three digits in uh, your chart. And I have one right here, you need to look at a chart like this in order to be able to uh, get the answer. And so when you look up 0 0.70, you get 0 0.7580. And then when you look up the eight, which is the third digit, which is all the way over here on the right side, look up the eight and follow it down to your row. And it actually had 24. Now 0.758 had 24, 0.759 had 27. Because of the three here, uh, I made it 25. When I look at the mark scheme, they left it as 24. They didn't really use this three. Maybe they just rounded it down to 0 0.708. So I put over here the mark scheme so you can see the difference. So I got, uh, 0 0.7605, uh, where they got 0 0.7604. And then of course you need to do your one minus, and I got 0 0.2395, they got 0 0.2396. Then you multiply it by 365 days and you come up with 87.4. So you could say either 87 or 88 uh, days because the 0.4 goes into the 88th day. Uh, I put 87, either one is acceptable. Then when we come down here, find the probability that Carly spends more than 142 minutes on social media on fewer than two of 10 randomly chosen days. So now we're talking about days. And these days are um, integer days, not you can't break it apart into partial days. So this is actually discrete data, the number of days out of 10. And this is a binomial distribution. So we're going to start with our notation again, our random variable is distributed binomially, we have our number of trials is 10. So of 10 days, so 10 is our number of trials, our probability of success we actually get from up here because we just figured out more than 142 minutes is 0.2395. So that's now our probability of success, although there's this 0.2396 and the probability of failure is 0.7605, uh, which for them is 0.7604. 
up here, I was okay. Down here, I do actually have a problem with one of my significant figures because of how I did this with the 25 there, just to let you know. Uh, so I got these values. Uh, what's important is your probability statement. It says fewer than two. So the probability that your random variable is less than two means uh, we don't wanna go from uh, two to 10. So less than two, we can do that. That's the uh, fewer options. So the probability that X is just zero or one. Don't include the two, there's not the equal to sign here. So we've just followed the binomial uh, distribution formula. It's in your formula sheet. And so we have 10 C zero times no success for this zero here, no success, 10 failures plus 10 C one times one success and nine failures gives you these two numbers, you add them together, gives you this and rounded to three significant figures gives me 0.269. Again, if you had used the two values that they had, because they did not use the three up here, uh, that would give you 0.268. So just be aware of that. Now, on 90% of the days, Carly spends more than T minutes on social media. So we're back to our normal distribution here because we're talking about the number of minutes and the probability or the, uh, the probability here was 90% uh, of the days. So this 90%. So we need to set up our normal distribution again, but this time we're gonna go backwards to it because they gave us the probability, the 90%, and we have to find the time. Okay, so normal distribution, X distributed normally, Here's our uh, mean and our variance. Uh, then the probability that X is greater than T, more than T minutes, greater than T, uh, equals 0 0.90. Now we have a greater than. So usually with the greater than, you do one minus the probability, but we can't do that here. If we do one minus the probability, that's only gonna give us 10%. And you can't look up, 10% on the probability distribution table uh, because, or this uh, normal distribution chart uh, because it starts at 50%. So we gotta use the 90%, but we gotta find another way of dealing with this greater than sign. So we take the 90%, look it up in the phi Z chart. Now 90% is 0 0.9000. And remember you're looking up the probability which is in the middle of the table. So you see the 0.8997, you can find that in the middle and then you need to add a plus three on the side. So for this first part, that will be point or 1.2 on the far left, the eight at the top here. And then in order to get this plus three to make it uh, 0.9000, uh, you'll have the two at the top of this one uh, to get your Z number. So your Z numbers are on the outside. The probability that you're looking up is here in the middle. So your Z number is 1.282. Uh, that represents the 90%, but to do the less than, if we wanna flip that inequality over to the less than, uh, because that's what your chart is uh, made from. It's made from the less than perspective. Uh, we need to make our Z negative. So if you can't do a one minus P, an alternative is to change your Z to negative. So we put that in our standardization formula. Here's our Z that's negative. Here's our little X, which is represented by the variable T minus 125 over 24, solve for t, t minus 25 equals a negative 30.768, t equals 94.232. To three significant figures, the time is 94.2 minutes. Uh, that 90% of the days, Carly would spend more than 94.2 minutes uh, on social media. And that's the end of this one. I hope that was helpful for you. 
Thank you for joining me in the Zoom room. Hope to see you again next time.